Well, this morning we are continuing with our four-part sermon series, Cultivating a Generous Life. And we're looking at part three today and understand we've been saying all these weeks uh, about what generosity really is, to kind of get a sense of how we put that into practice our lives, to get a good understanding of what the word actually means. Well, generosity, as we've been saying, is an understanding that all, that means nothing's left out, we have, or all that we are, will ever become, is not for us, to possess, but to be used for others to advance what? The kingdom for God's glory. That's a powerful definition that we're looking to add as a very important part of our lives as believers. And we've been saying as a pondering point, things that we should be thinking about throughout this sermon series and hopefully beyond too, is what do I hold back for mine over those things that are for the divine? It's like a pondering point to be thinking about all these weeks. And we uh, are talking about today generosity in missions, work beyond even our borders of our local community. And we have Bill Tate, uh, who will be sharing with us today, and he's asked that we would read from the book of Romans, uh, the New Testament epistle, the 10th chapter, verses 8 through 15. So hear now the word of the Lord. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I'd like to invite Bill Tate to come up and share with us on this message for GTI Hope. Bill, thank you, brother, for being here today, brother. God's peace to you. Thank you. In the year 2010, Operation World did a study of almost 250 countries around the world, <clears throat> and they came to the conclusion of all the unreached people groups with population of 10,000 or more, 75% were found in one country, and that was India. That means of all the people who have never heard the name of Jesus, 75% were in one country, India. Now. We decided then to, felt led to put together a three-year strategy for reaching unreached people groups. We had had 25 years of effective ministry before that, and I say that Christians like to try something they don't know if it works. Well, we were different. We put this strategy, based it on 25 effective years of ministry in India, and then transferred it to reach unreached people groups. So the strategy we came up with was the first year we would have Bible-based literacy classes for 450 adults. Most of the unreached people groups have a very low literacy rate, and literacy is essential for life uh, and essential for reading the Bible and coming to Christ, really. The second year we would train 12 church planters to begin planting churches, and the third year we would begin to reach out to families by having vacation Bible school for a thousand children and then uh, uh, 300 more adults would attend literacy classes. Now Bibles are, are, churches are started and people absolutely need to read the Bible. So that was the year 2010. Since then we have had over 150 unreached people groups complete that three year strategy. And we see regularly 750 people making decisions for Christ, about 150 baptized, and 800, 900, maybe 1,000 people attending churches in three years. Now that to me is absolutely incredible. Now, before I made this PowerPoint, 
or after I made the PowerPoint, we got a report from the three years strategy that your unreached people group completed, the Khanda Kamara and Andhra Pradesh, because of the Dollar Day project you did last year. And you made it possible for 150 adults to attend Bible literacy classes. Of those 150, 77 made decisions for Christ. 50%. 10 were baptized, and 95 were attending church. So I hope you're encouraged by the fact that because of that one project you did last year, 77 people came to faith in Christ, and 95 were attending church. That's incredible. This one church made that happen. But overall, I think the results are, are quite impressive. And so I ask myself, why is this ministry so effective? And so I want to share with you my observations as to why I believe this three-year strategy has been so effective. And the first reason is that the ministry we're talking about in India is done by local churches. It's Indian Christians reaching their own people. And it's Indian Christians relatively close to the area where the ministry is being done. In other words, if I said to you, who would be effective in witnessing to you for Christ? Somebody from France? Well, no. Somebody from the United States. How about California? No. How about Pennsylvania? Yes. How about Philadelphia? No. How about New York? I mean, nobody understands you and your situation like someone who lives in that situation. And so that's what we're doing in India. We're training churches that have been raised up by God in the areas where these unreached people groups are to take the gospel to them. So it's the Indian Christians who are the literacy teachers. It's the Indian Christians who are the church planners. It's the Indian Christians who are the VBS teachers. And when we, by the way, when we train a church planter to go out, we will not train a church planter unless they first come to us under the authority of a mother church. So they really are not under our authority. It's not an organization. It's the local church that the church planters come under. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. In Ephesians 5, 21, we read, No one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. In Acts 20, 28, Feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. The second reason I believe that the ministry is so effective is because we're going to where the people are. Um, take, for example, our, our literacy ministry. Um, all the literacy classes are held in the villages where the people live. There's, we have no schools, we have no buildings. They don't come to us we go to them. So the literacy classes are held under trees, in cow stables, along the road, you know, wherever they can be started. And I want to, by the way, we have an open invitation for anyone that wants to go to India and see these ministries. They can do it. And one person went and saw some of these literacy classes and wrote a little account of, of what they saw. So I want to read that to you. I think you'll enjoy it. We drove down the dirt road which leads into the actual village. It was wild. When we arrived, we helped the teacher get ready by helping her spread the yellow tarp which serves as a classroom. It literally was spread out in the dirt road in front of one row of tiny block houses and slowly the learners began to arrive. After a good percentage of the learners arrived, I was treated to amazing testimonies and examples of learners reading what they had learned. One read from the 23rd Psalm, another read from the 4th Primer. Another told how exciting it was that they can go back to their home village by themselves because they can read the bus sign boards and the schedule, and they don't have to pay someone to go with them who could read. Since the classroom was the road, every time a vehicle came by, the learners had to stand up in the back and lift up the edge of the tarp and let their vehicles pass. And then they would stretch it out again and sit back down. Dogs barking, children crying, and yet with all those distractions, somehow these learners were able to learn how to read. So we read in scripture 
go into all the world and preach the good news, not ask the world to come to us. And Acts 8.31, when Philip was witnessing to the Ethiopian eunuch, it says, Philip went up into the chariot, and he had a Bible study right in the chariot where the eunuch was. He didn't say, come to church next Sunday. And I think we in America need to realize that people aren't just going to come here. In your sphere of influence, your family, where you work, where you go to school, you need to be sharing what God means to you and encourage them to be a part of the church because there's no question in my mind that God works through the church. My whole life has been involved with the church and I've seen God work so tremendously. Uh, there's a drop-off in church attendance today. That needs to concern us very much and we need to each do something about it. A third reason I believe our ministry is so effective is that the Indian Christians are willing to make the necessary sacrifices. When they become the literacy teachers or the church planners or the VBS teachers, they go into these villages. Now, the literacy classes are held two hours a night, five nights a week for 10 months. So if someone asked you to be a literacy teacher in India, would you go? Do you have that kind of time, two hours a night, five nights a week for 10 months? We would say, I'm not sure if I have the time. But realize it's not just time. They're going into villages where there's cholera, where there's malaria, where there's typhoid, where people are, have these diseases and you can get sick, you can catch those. They're going into villages where people don't have bathrooms, they go in the fields. So there's filth, there's dirt, deodorant, forget about it. You've really got to think about some of these things. There's danger, there's witchcraft, there's black magic. The Indian Christians are willing to make the necessary sacrifices to bring the word of God to other people. Uh, I can tell you from my various times in India, the Indian Christians make us look like we're playing games. I mean, the dedication is terrific. And I always find that to be very challenging and inspirational. And so when we say that it's the local Indian church that is doing the ministry, it's effective ministry. I believe another reason why our three-year strategy is so effective is because the Word of God is central in all of our ministries. The first book that a literacy student gets when they graduate is their own copy of the Bible. The church planters are trained with 300 hours of Bible study. It's intensive. And they, when, when they go to the villages, they share the Gospel of John or a tr scripture tract that has scripture in it because they know that the word of God is powerful. The VBS kids memorize Bible verses. They sing those verses, go home to their Hindu parents and sing those. So the word of God is absolutely an integral part of every dimension of this ministry. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Ephesians 6, 17 says the word of God is the sword of the spirit. It's our, to be our offensive weapon. And Isaiah 55, 10 to 11 says that the word of God will not return empty, but it will accomplish the purpose for which it was written. A fifth reason I believe this ministry is so effective it is that it is holistic. It ministers to the whole person. In other words, when a person comes to literacy classes, every dimension of their lives can be uplifted in the name of Jesus. As they practice their reading, the literacy students also have little informational sheets that they read about. And so they'll learn about um, basic health, personal hygiene, how to keep your water pot clean so you don't get sick. Uh, they learn about uh, nutrition, proper diet, how to grow green vegetables in your garden and eat more nutritiously. Sanitation in the villages. They learn you shouldn't leave pools of stagnant water lying around where mosquitoes will breed and you get malaria. Family relationships. They'll learn self-help skills. These, most of the people in these unreached people groups are illiterate, and so they work out in the fields as laborers. They're paid 2 or $3 for a whole day's worth of work. They're cheated because they're illiterate. They don't know any better. So we try to teach them some skills 
so they can support their family. They may learn how to make soap powder, or they may start a little laundry business or a little tailoring business, or start a vegetable fruit stand. Then also, the Indian government actually has excellent programs for the poor. But if you're illiterate, you don't know about them. So we share some of the programs that the Indian government has, and they take advantage of those. Family relationships get improved. The dangers of alcohol are taught about, uh, the evils of child labor and child marriage. So the point is that when people come to literacy class, they just don't learn to read and write, which is huge, but every dimension of their lives, economically, socially, the family, everything can be lifted up in the name of Christ. I want to read you a, uh, a testimony from a woman by the name of Kelavathi. She's 47 years old. She's married with two sons. She lives in a slum village, and being illiterate forced her into one of the most menial of jobs, working as a coolie that is carrying heavy loads for meager wages. When the literacy class came to her village, notice that, the literacy class came to her village. She didn't go to it, it came to her. She was intrigued and joined the class. Her life of despair has completely changed. She can now read and write has learned the importance of keeping her home clean and is sending her sons to school. She has learned how to count money and even has a small amount in savings. She looks forward to being able to travel to town and even go to the bank now that she can sign her name. She now believes in Jesus and is attending church and even has a prayer cell meeting at her home. Her sons are learning about Jesus Christ and she has hope. Learning about good nutrition and sanitation has helped her health improve, and she is praying that she may be free of the many illnesses which have plagued her. She is praying that her whole family will come to know Jesus and that a church may come to her village. And the literacy classes minister to the whole person. A sixth reason why I believe our ministry is so effective is that people are being set free from the bondage of sin or from the depraved or old nature. All of us are depraved. All of us have an old nature. That's kindly, where do you think these things come from? Think, why, why do you act the way you do sometimes? It's, it's the old nature in you. And that's why we need Christ to come into our hearts to give us a new nature. And uh, 2 Timothy 2.26, the Apostle Paul says that regarding those that oppose the gospel, that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Taking them captive. Second Peter 2.19, the apostle Peter says that false teachers promise freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity for a person is a slave to whatever has mastered them. You did a dollar a day project last year and I'm going to give you the opportunity to do another one this year. And this year, you can reach a people known as the Yagav people. The Yadav people are only 12% literate, but women are abused. Men beat their wives for no reason. Children are sent to work in the fields instead of going to school. There's child marriage. Girls are married at age 15. Black magic and witchcraft. There's all kinds of things going on because the people are slaves to the old nature, to depravity. Romans 1.28 says, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. In all these years, I've had exposure to a lot of unreached people groups. I've written up descriptions of these. And most of these, the people actually act like animals instead of people. I think, why do they act like this? Now just think, if you had had no background in Christianity at all, your parents, your grandparents were all slaves of the old nature, and they just did whatever came naturally. There's no hope for these people apart from Christ. They need Christ to come into their lives and give them a new nature. John 8, 32 says, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And John 8, 36, so if the 
truth sets you free, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And we are seeing marriages change, we're seeing families change, we're seeing lives change tremendously when people come to Christ. And that brings me to the seventh reason why I believe this ministry is so effective is that eternal destinies are being changed. People are making decisions for Christ. That's the purpose of the whole ministry. And so every, um, in three years, we often see about 750 people make decisions for Christ, 150 baptized, sometimes eight or 900 or 1,000 people going to church in three years. Now, Velu is the director of our partner ministry in India that works with all the churches. And I have seen some tremendous results like I've been sharing with you. And I said to Velu once, I said, we're seeing such tremendous results. I mean, here in America, how many people do we see come to Christ in a year? How many new people come to the church? Hardly any. And here you're saying 750 in three years. That's incredible. I said, Velu, I said, sometimes I even have a hard time believing it myself. And he says, do you understand that these people have never once heard that there is a God who loves them? They never once learned that they are created in the image of God, that they have dignity, that God has a purpose for their lives, and that they don't have to do something for salvation. Salvation is a free gift. Christ has already paid the price for our sins. We just need to accept that gift. He said, they never known any of this at all. When you think about that, it makes sense that they're coming to Christ like this. John 15, 16, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit. And I, one of the prayers that I've had, in my, you might ask, why am I in this ministry all these years? I've had a prayer which I believe God has answered by putting me in this ministry. That is that my life would be as fruitful for the kingdom of God as it possibly can be. I hope you think about that. How many people will come to Christ because of you? Because you lived life on this earth. Colossians 1 test, 110 says we're to be fruitful in every good work. And I'm glad the fact that by participating in a dollar a day project, it will result in people literally coming to faith in Christ. An eighth reason and a final reason we're going to share with you why our ministry is so effective is that it is literally a work of God. It's effective because God is raising up churches in India in various places, and they are willing to become the literacy teachers, the church planners, the VBS teachers, and go into these villages. Now, I'm going to challenge you to do a dollar a day project, and this time the dollar a day project is going to be for people who live in the state of Bihar, and that state is one of the... Uh, least reached areas in the world and, and it's really one of the, it's one of the least evangelized mega populations Bihar has a population of 131 people that's just one state in India by the way Pennsylvania has a population of 13 million compared to 131 million and only five tenths of one percent of Bihar is Christian so we have the opportunity to uh, bring the gospel to this Yadav group that is living in Bihar. I believe it's the time. I believe God has raised up the church in India for now. And honestly, there's persecution in India. Organizations are being shut down. And then we, we need to do all we can while we can. 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, I have heard you in a time accepted. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time Behold, now is the day of salvation. And Revelation 3.8 says, Behold, I've set before you an open door. We now have a church that's willing to work with, in, in Bihar, to work with the Yadav people to bring them to Christ. The Yadav people have a literacy rate of 12%. That means only one in 10 people can read and write. They're considered untouchables. In Hinduism, in the caste system, if you're not a member of a caste, you're an untouchable. It's like you are not really a human being. They live in huts with no running water or electricity. 
Most are daily wage slavers, which means they go to the field, and if there's work that day, they get paid. If there's no work that, that day, they, don't get, they go home, they don't get paid. So there's no guaranteed income. Children are forced to work instead of going to school. Women are abused. They're beaten by husbands for no reason. The Yadav people worship idols, the sun, and ancestors. They've never heard the name of Jesus. We can give them that opportunity. The way you can participate is being willing to uh, be a part of the Dollar Day Project again this year. That means you would take a little uh, commitment card like this. Each one of you should have one. You can fill it out. And that means you're willing to set aside a dollar a day each day for just one year. By doing that, you will enable this job to have people to be reached with the gospel. I thought about my dad. He had his own business. I used to ride with him in the car. And uh, at the end of the day, as a treat for me, he would buy me a York peppermint patty, one of those big ones. They were a nickel. A few years ago, I would talk about this project. I'd say, you can go to the store now and get a peppermint patty for a dollar. A dollar doesn't even buy a piece of candy, hardly. Guess what? Go to the store today. A peppermint patty is $1.69. We even went to a hardware store where we saw a peppermint patty for $2.69, and it shrunk. It's smaller in size. And I just say to you, everything is going up. It's nuts. My house insurance went up. My car insurance went up. The cost of milkshakes used to be, I, I like milkshakes, by the way, used to be $3.50. Every milkshake is 5 bucks anymore. Everything, everything you look is going up. So the fact that a dollar a day is even much less now than it was even just a few years ago. To think that you can bring the gospel to these people, you can change their lives for time and eternity is tremendous. So I hope many of you will fill out one of these cards and then that means you'll get a silk purse like this. You can put a dollar each day in it and a dollar fits in this and you can do that and bring the money in at the end of each month. Or if you give it electronically, take one of these. Just put this on your breakfast table and pray for these people. Be thankful that it's they who are in these villages and not you who are teaching the literacy classes, who are the church planners, who are the BBS teachers. Take one of these and, and put it in. I'm going to share two other things with you. You may be a little premature and you're playing there. I just had a couple more things to play, but to share with you, but I want to give you a challenge today to go on an adventure in the next year, not just put a dollar a day aside, but to think about unexpected income. My wife and I belong to a church that did the dollar a day project, and we did it just like I'm asking you to do it. And I challenged that church. I said, think about unexpected income. Would you say to God, if you bring something to me this year during the next 12 months that I'm not expecting, I know it's of you, I'll give it to this project. Do you know what happened to me that year? We were doing this project in my own church. The United States government sent me a check for $600, which I absolutely did not need. Do you know how much fun it is to have the United States government contribute $600 to spread the gospel in India? That's tremendous. That's what happened. Join with me, if you will, in this next year and, and taking it, I, mean, I don't know what God will do, maybe nothing, but maybe something, and maybe you'll just know it when some unexpected gift comes your way that that's for this project during this year. Do that. Then another thing I've done, uh, which I think is important, is money that you would have spent but you don't. If you would have spent it, it's gone. You just happen not to spend it. Well, what am I talking about? Well, I took care of my parents. They both died when they were 93, and in the last 10 years of their life, they would love to take a trip with me to Burden Hand Restaurant, which was 40 miles from our home. They just love to go there, and that's what we do. I got married late in life, and my wife and I bought a house what do you think? It's six miles from Burden Hand Restaurant, not 40 miles. And sometimes I'll say to her, would you like to go to Burden Hand tonight? Sometimes she'll say yes. 
Sometimes she'll say, no, I already set the meat out. We'll just eat at home. Well, if she had said yes, we would have gone. We would have spent that $30, but it would. So that would have been gone. You wouldn't miss it. Think of that as well. Well, I would just challenge you to take one of these purses, pray for India every day, put it on your breakfast table, put a dollar in each day, and think about unexpected income or money that you normally spend, but don't, and put that in. I've read this statistic recently that it's, it's amazing to me. It's hard to believe, I think, because advertising is so effective in the United States. I mean, if you drive a Buick, you ought to drive a BMW. 47% of the world's population makes $2,500 a year or less. Half the world. 84% of the world's population makes less than $11,000 a year. I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty or bad, but we are rich. We, are, we have so much, it isn't funny compared to thousands of people around the world. So I want to close with this scripture, 1 John 3, 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? I hope that you will enthusiastically take one of these and be a part of this program for the next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. We're going to take a moment to pray. Church, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear what is being done in other parts of the world. Father, we rejoice in the ministries that have occurred there and the number of people that have learned literacy, Thank learned God. how to read, but also, God, that have received the message of Jesus and the gospel has planted seeds in their lives and churches are changing people in that country. Thank so God. many unreached Jesus. people. God, we thank you that we have an opportunity to partner with Glad Tidings India once again this year. Lord, we have made a difference already, but we continue, Lord, to pray that you're looking forward to what you're about to do. So we pray for the unreached people group that we're going to impact, God, for your glory, for your kingdom. Lord, I thank you for Bill and for his willingness to, to share with us today, for him and his wife to come and to challenge us. Lord, it's, it's good at times to be challenged by things. But beyond being challenged, it's move into action. So, Father, I pray for every heart gathered in this place that, oh, we have been blessed, truly blessed as a nation and as a people and as a community. And we as a church want to give back. Yes, Lord, we give back to our community. We give back to our nation. But we also give around the world. So we are truly thankful that we have the opportunity as your people to share with the people in India. The Lord, people we may never meet on this side of heaven, but one day, oh God, oh, the joy and celebration that we have when we're together in heaven and we're sharing and meeting these people face to face, hearing conversations, how the gospel changed their lives, Lord. That is a beautiful picture. I look forward to it with hope for the work that you're about to do through these people here, God, to see again in heaven and to rejoice with you. And I ask all this in the precious name of Jesus, the name that we speak. Amen.